Habitat's musician, luthier, and 1995 National Heritage Fellow, Wayne Henderson. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Wayne Henderson is involved in all aspects of the guitar. He plays them and he makes them, and he's superb at both. Born and raised in Grayson County, Virginia, in the beautiful, music-loving Appalachian Mountains, Wayne Henderson's guitar playing stands out with his great and unusual style of finger picking, which has won him more than 300 ribbons at Fiddler's Conventions. Featured in three tours of the Masters of the Steel String Guitar, he's performed throughout the country, including Carnegie Hall and the Smithsonian, as well as touring through Europe and Asia. But Wayne Henderson also has a giant reputation as one of the country's best luthiers, that is, someone who makes and repairs stringed instruments. He makes mandolins, fiddles, banjos, and most particularly, guitars. To own a Henderson guitar is to own a superbly crafted, handmade instrument. The work is slow, and Henderson will not be rushed. So the waiting list is a long one, and it's made up of the famous and the not-so-famous. A neighbor is more likely to get a Henderson guitar than a star. In fact, a book was written about Eric Clapton's long wait and Henderson's guitar-making process. It's called Clapton's Guitar, Watching Wayne Henderson Build the Perfect Instrument. Wayne Henderson is also committed to keeping musical traditions alive and vibrant. He hosts an annual music festival, and his workshop is an open house with folks dropping by, watching, and learning from him, often picking up a sander or picking out a tune in the process. Last summer, that's where I caught up with Wayne, and you'll occasionally hear some noise from his workshop. We sat down with some lemonade and got down to the business at hand, music and guitars. How long have you been playing the guitar now, Wayne? Well, I've been playing uh, guitar for probably 60, 61 years now. I started when I was five. My brother had got an old guitar, and uh, he showed me three chords on it. And my dad was an old-time fiddler, and it wasn't long I could take those three chords and learn how to back up his fiddle play. You know, could play some chords with him. And then I've been playing ever since. I could, you know, do that, and I've played pretty constantly. I don't remember... No time in my life that I've missed more than a few days. Your father played fiddle. Yeah. Did your brother play too? Yeah, my brother played mandolin. And later on, he, he gave up on the guitar. And later on, he got to play in mandolin. And so we played a lot. And I had cousins that lived just across the road, and especially one named Catherine who could play some Carter family tunes. And she taught me some of my first picking out lead guitar and I, I could walk over to her house, you know, and, and she would teach me those tunes, and I'm sure I wore her out traveling over there every chance I got to try to get her to show me another tune. And that really helped my enthusiasm about playing to be able to, you know, pick out a tune like maybe like Maybelle Carter would do. And uh, those cousins, a couple of them got so they could play pretty good, and I, you know, could play pretty good music with them, you know, to play lead guitar and we learned some guitar tunes and stuff like that and then in the 60s I got a hold of the Doc Watson record and you know Doc didn't live 45 minutes from right here you know but I'd never seen him or heard tell of him and uh, when he started putting those records out in the 60s I couldn't believe my ears that anybody could play a guitar like that. What was it about Doc Watson and his playing? Well it was a new thing to us then Doc, back in the 50s, played in a rockabilly band that would play all kinds of gigs they could get. And uh, sometimes they would play square dances, and they did not have a fiddle player. It's more of a rockabilly band. And Doc, when they played for a square dance, would play a tune like Down Yonder or Turkey in the Straw or any, any old fiddle tune like that for them to dance. And you'd have to, when they start dancing, they want to dance for 20 minutes. And I've heard... Doc told me before he'd play those tunes, it felt like his arm was going to fall off. But that's how he learned how to do that so good. He so he was taking those fiddle tunes and playing them on the guitar. Yeah, and when he started making those records, he fell back on some of that stuff that he knew how to do that almost nobody else had ever done. Certainly not out on national recordings or anything. 
and he'd also take old songs, you know, that people, country songs that people would sing, and turn that into a guitar instrument. Well, that was a new thing. when I'd hear that guitar, you know, what he was doing on that. And then, of course, he started trying to learn how to do some of that. It wasn't long in the late 60s I got to meet Doc because he lived close by, and I ran into him over in a music store in Boone, North Carolina, and he, I was sitting there picking a Carter family tune, uh, Cannonball Blues, I still remember that. And I heard this voice behind me. I was sitting on a stool in that store picking, playing that, and I heard somebody singing. I just ran and I turned around and sure enough, I thought it sounded familiar and turned around and it was Doc. Walked up, sang that song with me and I like to fell off the stool, you know. And he was a super nice guy. And even He'd done been making records and stuff then and, and he was, uh, you know, getting well known. And to me, he's somebody really famous, you know, that Doc never did act like he was famous and didn't even want you to even mention anything like that, you know. And he just wanted to be a regular like everybody else but he was certainly was special to me and everybody else in the world and uh, he was one of my biggest influences and E.C. Ball was another influence. I was going to ask you about him. And uh, he lived right in this community and he was a uh, played with a thumb pick and he certainly influenced my style of playing because he used a thumb pick. He was a wonderful player and he, in most of the years that I knew him he played gospel music and but Every once in a while, he would play a hillbilly tune, you know, to show me some guitar stuff. He was a wonderful player, a great songwriter, and people still today record his music. Describe uh, a little bit about that special way you have of picking that really is pretty unique to you. Well, I think that's uh, Mr. Ball's influence and all is what caused the unusual style of playing that I do. If you listen to one of my tunes, most people think I'm using a flat pick. If you just hear it, because I pick down strokes with my thumb and up with my first finger. So it works like a flat pick. You pick up and down, up and down. Never hit a up stroke with my thumb or a down stroke with my finger. But if I do, I never do that on purpose because it'll yank my pick off. And that's a little unusual style of playing, but Mr. Ball thought I needed to learn to play like he did and uh, use the thumb pick. And uh, with enough work and practice, I got so I could do it. <laughs> That's all right. Let me ask you this, and I don't even know if you have an answer for it, but your father played, your brother played, your cousins played, Doc Watson lives up the road, E.C. Ball lives down the road. What is it about this area and musicians? I have never seen so many musicians per square foot in my life. That's always been the same thing for as long as I can remember and way further back than that. This area is well known for old-time musicians. It's remote in the mountains of Appalachia here, and there's not, it was never easy to get around. You know, a lot of people didn't have cars and stuff, and I've heard, my grandpas both played old-time music, and I've heard them talk about walking for miles, you know, to go play at the schoolhouse or somebody's house for a dance or something. And I think it was just a way of entertaining in these mountains when you could get together and play music. And... I think this music, this old time music, goes back for hundreds of years. You know, people that settled this area came from Scotland and Ireland and England and, you know, places like that, which they brought fiddle music with them. And, you know, there were still, you know, slaves and people from Africa here that played. They brought the banjo with them. They had banjos made out of gourds and stuff like that. And I think that's where the heart and soul of old time music is a fiddle and banjo. And they play together, and so that was two cultures that just happened to come together here in, in this area. People often confuse 
not people from southwestern Virginia, but the rest of us can often confuse uh, bluegrass and old-time music. What's the distinction? Well, you get asked that a lot. The bluegrass music came along, I think, uh, the name of it, for sure, was Bill Monroe. You know, he was a, a musician from Kentucky, and he, he sort of devised a, a type of music at the time when he had Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs playing in his band. And that band together, to me, is almost the best bluegrass band I've ever heard. And it was sort of the first one to be known and called bluegrass, and that was like in 1945. And old-time music, been around forever, you know, since what I was talking about a while ago, when settlers settled this part of the country. That's been around, and I think it is more designed for dance music. You know, we'd love to dance and play in that old-time music. You get that fiddle and banjo going right together. When that's going real good, you almost can't be still. You know, you can't help patting your foot or, if you know, if you like me, can't dance, at least you want to pat your foot. That's sort of difference. And then bluegrass has a different style of playing. You know, I really like the way they do because they take solos on their instruments and it, and it centers on the singing. They do like three-part harmony singing, which takes a lot of practice and work to learn how to do. And then between each verse and course of a Tune, they usually take a solo on the instrument, the fiddle, banjo, and, and even the guitar later on, you know, let us play a little once in a while. It's all good as far as I'm concerned, you know, but it is a different style and a different way of doing and And the, probably the biggest deal, noticeable thing in bluegrass and old time is the banjo style. When Bill Monroe had that band back in the 40s, the great bluegrass band, he had this young fellow named Earl Scruggs playing banjo who, who had sort of invented a style of playing, or at least brought it out to the public, where he played a three-finger roll-type banjo. And that was something people had never heard before, and they just went wild over it. playing was done with a, just usually your fingers and a drop thumb lick and it's a beautiful melodic style of playing. It's like nothing else, you know, they call it claw hammer or old time frailing and it's like, you know, night and day difference in those banjo styles. distinctive difference in bluegrass and old time. Now, when did you start making guitars? Well, I've started making guitars for as long as I can remember. People in this, you know, Appalachian region, you know, have never been, most of everybody were farmers and didn't have lots of money, you know, to go out and buy fancy instruments. Mr. Ball was talking about had a nice old Martin guitar that he got somehow way back in the 40s. And uh, he always had that thing, and it was the best guitar in the community. And he would let me look at it, and I wanted one of those things so bad I couldn't stand it. But absolutely could not afford one, you know, and, and me or my family, either one. So I would go up and look at it. I think, you know, I always made stuff. I've always been a craft person. I whittled and carved and made all my toys when I was a kid. And your mother did, too. And my mom did, too. And my dad was a pretty good good carpenter, you know, he could make, do stuff you needed on the farm. My grandpa was a great craftsman, you know, he, they, they built houses and made caskets and all kind of things. And so it was always in my family, you know, to be a craftsperson. So that old guitar, I'd look at it and I'd say, this thing ain't made out of nothing but wood, I should be able to make one of these. Of course, I had a hard time getting much done because I had, you know, no materials and tools and just what was on the farm, but I... I fashioned out a, a guitar that just by drawing around maybe the old one that I had first or Mr. Balls Martin and he'd let me look at it but he certainly wouldn't take the strings off. He was so particular with it I could feel on the inside of it or anything. I got started at it like that. 
you know, starting trying to find material was really a challenge because I knew those sides had to be bent somehow, and I had no idea how to do that. I had observed a piece of walnut veneer in my mom's dresser drawer bottom. That the veneer was real thin, but it's walnut, pretty wood, and I noticed it was flexible. And I thought, well, that stuff will bend if I could get that off there. Of course, I didn't know what mom would think about me getting her dresser drawer bottom, but one evening I slipped it out, and she didn't know it, and put it in the branch and ran down to the house. And sure enough, the next morning, that veneer was soaked loose and come off, and I got, got it off of there and, and dried the board off and put it back in my mom's dresser, and she didn't never miss that walnut veneer off of it. <laughs> and, but I had some thin wood, so I bent that and, and glued it together with the only glue I had was some old black rubber stuff that my dad put weather stripping on his truck door. And I'd seen him do that, and so he'd just stick it, and it sticks right there, so he didn't have to clamp it. And stuff, and I thought, well, that's a ticket. I can do that, you know, without having forms or clamps or anything that I didn't have and didn't know how to make. So I worked my whole school vacation between farm work and stuff, getting that guitar made. And then when it got August, and heat and humidity set in on that. I had it out in the outbuilding where nobody had been seeing it, and, and had it almost done. Had the body made, the neck made, and everything. And uh, I went out there one day, and it got hot, and that spring and it's still left and that walnut veneer and that old rubber glue got hot that thing just totally came apart and I was so disappointed and my dad could tell there's something wrong with me you know after a while I told him I tried to make a guitar and of course they wasn't into that guitar making that was an unheard of thing and nobody around did that and thought that was a total waste of time you know but my dad had a little bit of interest in it, I think, and he said, the next time it's a rainy day where we can't work on the farm, I'll take you over to see a fellow named Albert Hatch, and Albert had made some fiddles. So one day, sure enough, he did. He took me over there to go see Albert, and he lived just, you know, 25 miles away over in Lansing, North Carolina. We went over there one day, and I couldn't believe Albert. He got a fiddle out that he had made in 1953, and he saw my interest and he helped me and he told me how to bend a piece of wood. He gave me a piece of wood that somebody had thrown out of an old door and it was mahogany and he said, son, this is a piece of mahogany. It's the same thing a Martin's made out of and that just drove me wild. And it was thin, eighth of an inch thick and, and he told me how to take a hot metal pipe and then wet the wood on the inside and just bend it around that pipe. And sure enough, that worked. He also told me to get some weldwood carpenter's glue. He said that'll hold it together till the cows come. And sure enough, it did. That guitar's still together. I still have it. And that was about 1964. It took me another whole year to make that guitar. Albert was a big help. And when I showed him that, that old guitar was a pretty rough, crude operation for a guitar, but it worked and played. And... Uh, Albert looked at it and he said, Lord, son, if I'd known you'd have made this, done this good, I'd have got you some better wood. And he, he gave me a catalog where I could order some rosewood and he knew I was into it. And then my next guitar was nicer. So then I got to doing repair work on Martins. And uh, I learned most of what I know how to do by doing repairs. Every time I did any kind of repair work on a Martin, I would look at uh, chisel marks, sand marks, anything on the bracing and try to figure out, well, how did they do this? You know, what process? So that's how I learned mostly, and I still learn stuff, you know, from other, nowadays there's guitar builders absolutely everywhere. What sound do you go for? Well, I like a nice, deep, woody tone, you know, that happens by trimming your braces lightly in the top and, and uh, they have to be left heavy enough so your instrument will hold up under the stress of the strings. If you can get them carved down to where the, that top vibrates at its best, you know, the most it will do. You can hear that. I've always had to learn to do it by just listening and my daughter, since she's been helping me build and building her own stuff, I was trying to teach her. It's hard to teach somebody how to listen to a piece of wood, the tone that it has. Does a guitar need to be played for a bit in order to develop its sound? 
Does that make sense as a question? Oh, yeah, for sure. And that's a very good question because almost every instrument you make, when it gets played just a little bit, the next day will sound better. And they say, you know, everybody says old instruments always sound better than new ones. But I think uh, those old instruments sound much better when they've been used and played. Well, I'm no scientist or anything, but I think those pieces of wood, stuff I've always heard and makes sense to me, when you put that string on there and the vibrations from the string, you know, makes the top move and vibrate and that creates a sound chamber waves on the inside of the body that you can feel when you tap on it or play on anything, you can feel air come out the sound hole. I mean, something's moving and those the grains of wood is linear, you know, like in the top. The grain of the wood runs from the back end to the front end. And those sound waves travel through those grains of the wood. And they say the more they do that, it lines up the molecules of the wood and it gets them in line with each other. The more they vibrate, those sound waves travel through the piece of wood. That makes sense to me that they would do that. And the more that happens, the easier they go through there. They get lined up. And uh, I think that's the reason the old instruments sound so good. And they, they've been used and played. And the most noticeable time they can hear that's when you first string up an instrument. When you put string it up the very first time. Sometimes it'll sound wonderful as soon as they put a string on it. But it always gets better. Just in a few hours and then the next day for sure. Then after that it slows down. You have to play on it a lot to notice much difference, you know. I was at Galax with uh, Joe Wilson and his back was to this man who had a guitar and this guy's back was to Joe Wilson and he's strumming on the guitar and Joe looked at me and he said he's playing a Henderson and indeed he was I mean but that's how distinctive it was and I know you made a Henderson for Joe oh yeah Joe he's a big influence on me too when he was the director of the National Council for Traditional Arts he always recognized what little bit I could do and was, you know, very instrumental in getting me to get out and go to festivals and be seen and get my instruments out where people would see them other than right here in, in the community. His organization at that time was responsible for me getting to go to Asia and places like that and uh, get to travel and and when that happens, you know, you get out in the world, you know, people see your instruments and hear you play, and that that's a big help. You had been working as a mail carrier. Yep, I always did that, and I also kept my shop, too. You know, I was building instruments first and farming, and I got to being a substitute mail carrier, which was easy to do. It was an extra job and made some money, and uh, I could still do my what I love doing is building my instruments and I always did that then I got to be a full-time mail carrier and I thought well that's such a good deal you know I knew eventually I would have retirement and insurance and health insurance and stuff like that that keeps a lot of people working and I, I pretty much enjoyed doing that too I was a rural carrier which is the best deal you can have in that postal service deal, because I got to travel around to up, up every holler in here that people live, and I knew everybody, and, and I got to do it in my own community right here, and it was a fun job to do, and it was something that I could pull off and, and then come back home and do my guitar shop every day. So I didn't make as many instruments, you know, along that time, but... Or travel I, as much, I would think. Or travel as much, and... I got to do uh, quite a bit of traveling, though, too, because I had a lenient postmaster, and, and they understood my craft and what I did playing music, and uh, they would always work with me. I had a great substitute that would work for me. I could usually could get off to do important music jobs, you know, and stuff like that. That always worked out really good, and I was able to do that, like, for 32 years till I retired, and then ever since then, I've work much harder, you know, and everything, but and as I get older, it seems like I even like making instruments even better. It seems like I never get tired of it. Even string up a new, I made like 600 guitars, and uh, if I get a new instrument strung up, it just seems like as much fun as ever to hear that first tone and sound, you know. I always sit and play them and listen, and, and it's always exciting, good thing to do. And finally, 
I do want to mention the Wayne Henderson Music Festival. And the winner of that festival actually gets a Henderson. Oh, no, yeah, they do. And uh, that usually draws in some really good players. And contest is always really good. And a lot of people show up early in the day to see that. And then we have music. Usually it's somebody I can trade a guitar for if it's a big shot. It's a totally volunteer organization and nonprofit. And every bit of the money that we make goes to into a scholarship fund that's uh, distributed out every year to kids to learn how to play this music. You know, it's a cool festival. It's up in the most gorgeous state park you've ever seen right here in the, this community. People really seem to enjoy it. And my only job mainly is to select, you know, who I can get to come play. And, and that's always somebody good. You know, we Doc come and did it like three different times. And actually, Doc's always been a good friend, and he said he would help me start it. He came and played the very first festival we ever had was successful. And uh, that is a lot because Doc volunteered to come play at it. And it always helps to have somebody national or famous to come in to play and all that. But some of the best music you'll ever hear, you know, comes from right around here. You know, my goal is to promote this music in general and anything I can do to help or preserve it, I have to always try to do. And that's, I think, where the National Heritage Fellowship Award is also so important in the way you received one in 1995, I think, and the way it highlights the importance of traditional art in all its many aspects. Oh, yeah. That was, I was always so, you know, honored and stuff to get that and would never have ever thought to happen. I've always known about it and known the people that got it, you know, like Doc and Earl Scruggs and B.B. King and all about instrument makers, but craft people in general. That was always a, you know, an exciting thing to me, you know, and to be honored like that. And they also, you know, they gave me some money, you know, and I took, I sold some of my antique stuff and took that money I got from that and built me a new shop. So I use that Heritage Award every day, ever since 1995. So I've certainly made use of it. I wouldn't have had that nice shop out there, you know, if it hadn't been for that. That's a cool thing, and I've always appreciated that. <laughs> That was guitarist, luthier, and 1995 National Heritage Fellow, Wayne Henderson. You can find out about the 2015 National Heritage Fellows at arts.gov. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. To find out how art works in communities across the country, keep checking the Artworks blog, or follow us at NEA Arts on Twitter. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening. Thank you.